You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow a side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews. So let's get started. Hey, hey guys, welcome back to the show. Today on the show, we have a woman who started a travel movement. Her name is Evita Robinson, and she's the founder of Nomadness Travel Tribe. Evita has always been a creator in visual media, yet it was a trip to Paris six weeks after graduating from undergrad that changed the scope of her personal and professional life. In September 2011, she created the Nomadness Travel Tribe, an online social community primarily for travelers of color. Nomadness was the first of its kind targeting diverse millennials in the newly coined Black Travel Movement. The group currently surpasses 16,000 international members with over 100,000 passport stamps and nearly 100 meetups a year all across the globe. Evita has shattered the myth that people of color don't travel. She's also a keynote speaker, TED resident, consultant for destination marketing organizations, and continues her love of seeing the world while writing her first book. On today's episode, Evita gets into how Nomadness started and how she never expected it to be a business, why she doesn't believe in five-year plans and why we shouldn't either, why we all need multiple revenue streams, how she recovered from near burnout, and how she decides what's best for her brand. Let's get into it. Welcome to the guest chair, Vita. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. I am so happy to have you here. So tell us a little bit about your background. You are a very eclectic woman. Now, how did your upbringing influence this entrepreneurial fire? It's funny. I don't really know how it did. You know, I, I grew up in a single parent home for a long time after my mother and my stepfather had actually split. So the triad for most of my childhood was really myself, my mom, and my younger brother. And I have a younger sister. We have the same father, different mothers who grew up down south and was a bit closer to my biological dad. But it's really my, I think my paternal side of the family are a lot of the entrepreneurs. You know, even to this day, my grandmother and her sisters, uh, my aunts and great aunts, they kind of do this like catering thing in Long Island. And whenever they needed a bartender, they would reach out to me and I would kind of come in. And it was, it was this thing that the family did and was a part of their history that we would all kind of chip in on, but they never went full, full force with it. You know, and I always wondered why, but it showed that there was an entrepreneurial spirit and, you know, especially with the women and my grandfather on my father's side, he, I remember growing up and him being paralyzed from the waist down for as long as I can remember, but he never let it stop him. So my grandfather had crutches that he would always have, but he would get around the entire house and the city and drive. He had an extra knowledge that he had on his uh, steering wheel so that he could still maneuver. Like he was stubborn in many ways. And one of them was just that he was never going to let even his ailments and disabilities stop him from doing what he needed to do in any regard. But the accident came because he was too an entrepreneur. He used to do um, like landscaping and he had actually fallen off of a roof and landed on his neck. And so after the surgery and everything, he was paralyzed from the waist down. But I mean, you just, it's just how I knew my grandfather, but my grandfather just always kept, you know, he had a garden, he had his own house down South, like he would mow his own lawns, like he was doing what he had to do. And it was never, uh, you know, a home that I would observe where there were excuses made for not being able to do something. And so I think really on the paternal side of my family is where a lot of the entrepreneurs come, even my father with um, things that he does. He has this organization called the Black, Black Men's Health Initiative. And he has these like artistic attributes as well that I think trickled down through me, through DNA. And, um, and so I think that really just observation maybe being young, but the caveat to that is I never lived with any of these people. So <laughs> it was observation, but kind of like observation from afar. You know, the people I lived with, you know, had government oriented jobs and, you know, were on the fast track to doing what they needed to do. But none of them that I lived with were entrepreneurs. And so I didn't have that in my face as anything to pull from. I think for me personally, I just always have been somebody who 
respects as long as I get it back, but kind of always had a little bit of a thing with authority and knowing that I wanted to at some point be my own boss and not have to uh, adhere to any restrictions or limitations that somebody else could ever put on me. And so I think deep down inside, I always knew that I was going to be running something of my own. I just didn't know what it was going to be and when that was going to happen. That's amazing. And that kind of leads us right into the next thing I wanted to ask, which was what was your original career path before starting to form Nomadness as a real business? Right. Um, television production, which to this day, honestly, is still something that I, I adore very much. I was not one of these people that went to school and started a degree program that I didn't believe in. I loved it. I always talked a lot. I had an opinion. I loved being on camera. I used to perform. So all of those things kind of played into, you know, me getting into mass communications, mass comm. And I went to Iona College and my degree focus was television and video production. And I minored in fine art. So I've always been a creative before I've been a businesswoman. And it's something that you see in the way that I maneuver certain projects and ideas that come to fruition for Nomadness. I let the vision take over a lot and really lean into the innovation side of what we're doing and the more creative side of what we're doing than kind of like the stuffy like business stuff. So for me, all of that kind of plays into the bigger picture, but I was freelancing in television, working on a number of television shows. Um, I've worked for a number of production companies and networks that you know are popular today. And that's what I wanted to do, but I wanted to finagle myself from behind the camera as like an associate producer into on-air talent and like direction and executive producing. But it was interesting because in a position I had, say it was maybe two years before I started No Madness, you know, I was so close to being in that, what I thought was the my, my mecca, being a producer. And I had some really close friends that were in that position. And I was just like, yo, there's got to be something more than this. And it was no shade to what they were doing. Like, I loved it and I loved being creative, but it wasn't enough for what I had inside. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know how it was going to come into fruition. It kind of forced itself out of me as I started traveling more. But even now, like we're pitching a television show, you know, it's been really cool. We have our web series is in partnership with Issa Rae. Like I've been working with Issa for the last three, almost four years now. She's a good friend, a mentor. And, um, and I even got a cameo this season on Insecure. So it's like, (laughs) yeah, yeah. (laughs) Season two, episode two, art gallery scene. I'm a curator. So shouts out to Issa and Melina who directed that episode and gave everybody the go ahead to let it happen. But it's like, you know, you will always see that. You know, I just got back from a, you know, a trip to LA working on some stuff in that realm too. And TV has always been a dream of mine. It's been a personal dream even before No Madness. And that dream has never left. I still very much love the idea of production. So it's full steam ahead and it'll come to fruition when it's supposed to. You know what I love about No Madness and really why I just wanted to talk to you is because the travel tribe aspect just seemed to grow so organically from the outside looking in. But I know that there had to be intention and strategy behind it. So can you tell us how the idea came about and then when did you make the decision to focus on growing it as a business and why? Yeah, there was intention, but there was not strategy um, (laughs) at all. I had no idea what I was creating. I knew that I, as a 20-something year old, I was 27 when I started No Madness. So as like a 27-year-old, three-time expat, black chick, I was just like, yo, there's got to be other people out here that revere travel as much as I do and have it as a priority to the level that I do. And there was no community for that. Like the big thing at that time were just like these Twitter chats. And I'm like, dude, like I can figure out the top 10 places wherever to find whatever. Like it's so much deeper than that for me. And so, you know, I wanted to create a community that was more familial. That was something that was, you know, really connecting folks. And it wasn't just the influencers. It was like the actual people that were doing this that I felt like I could relate to. And I wanted to get like-minded travelers of color kind of like in the same place at the same time. And so when I didn't see it, I created No Madness with 100 people. I chose Facebook because everybody was on it. Everybody's still on it. There's a quote that I heard that I use all the time, that if the internet was a geographical location, Facebook would be the capital. And I believe that's still to this day true. And Mark Zuckerberg is going to do 
do whatever the hell it takes to make sure that that stays true. And so there was something really easy with the transition of building it out as a Facebook group, but it just took off and the word of mouth and the the level of conversation and frequency of conversation, it showed me very early on that I was onto something and I didn't know what it was. And at that point in time, I had been let go from a show just because this is, you know, the nature of television. And I decided to like, you know, take a stab at it and be like, look, I can either try to run back back into this rat race or I can like take this unemployment. You know, it's shit, but it's something, you know, and at least give it a couple months to hash out and see what this is that I've created over here. You know, and I made that decision and I've never gone back. It's been approaching six years and I have not worked for anybody else. And so it's it's a hustle and it's a grind and it's an alignment that you have to be in. And it's constant innovation and creation and testing, you know, trial and error. But, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way. But there was absolutely no strategy. Like outside of just growing it on Facebook, like I didn't know what it was. So it took a lot of saying yes to the things that the community brought to me, even though I wanted to say no, because I wasn't sure I wanted to get in that deep, but saying yes, opened up to so many things. Like I had no idea that it was going to be a business. All of a sudden people were like, well, we want trips and I want a t-shirt. And as soon as money started exchanging hands, I was like, okay, this is a business. Like I have to get an LLC together. Then it was just like, you know, I didn't know if I wanted to travel with these people, but they were like, okay, this is a travel group. So we just going to sit here and talk about it. Are we going to be about it? Next thing I know, I'm curating, you know, group trips when before that I had traveled the majority of the world alone. So I'm like, I don't even know how this is going to work, you know, (laughs) and so like, I don't even know if I like you people enough for this shit. But I said, yes, you know what I'm saying? And it ended up being some of the most life changing experiences for them, but also for me, you know, and it's been this funnel system and this trustworthiness that's built over years between listening to them, also listening to my integrity and what I know the vision is for, you know, the next five or six years and finding that middle ground in which we both can play, you know, and, and be happy and experience the world in different arenas. So yeah, the strategy kind of reveals itself. I'm also not a, um, like, I don't believe in like five-year plans and 10-year plans. I really don't believe in plans that are over at the max, like two years, because I feel like anything after two years, it just, it gives you this silent license to get lazy. And it just, it makes those goals very esoteric, right? It's like, you know, I want a million dollars in 10 years. Like, well, anything can happen in 10 years and you can use it as an excuse to not do the steps today that can get you to that point where for me, if at the maximum I'm going out is 18 to 24 months, there are things that I can do right now that will shape those days leading up to that 18 to 24 months. So things have got to be very tangible to me. Even if they're grandiose, they've still got to be tangible where I can put a brick down today that's going to affect that outcome tomorrow. And I just feel like strategy wise, like five to 10 years, like when people ask me that question, I'm like, I, I, I don't know. Like, you know <laughs> that's so I'm just real. Like, I have, no, that's I have so goals real. I can give you, yeah. but I can't sit here and tell you what nomads is going to look like in five more years. Because if I would have told you that in the beginning, if we would have went on that trajectory, the thing would have concave years ago. You know, like that changes. I also don't believe in perfection. I think perfecting is a verb. It's something that's active, that's always happening. And, you know, the things that you want change, the goals that you have change. And having goals that are malleable and bendable without breaking, I think is really, really integral, especially as an entrepreneur, because shit happens all the time. Yep. So speaking of perfection and not believing in it now, what were some of those first trips like and what were the early blunders that also helped to define the kind of business you wanted to build? Well, the first trip was Panama. And I mean, it was dope because there were no preconceived notions, but um, it ended up being really well and everybody bonded and had a really great time. And, you know, so much so that the first trip landed in the pages of Ebony magazine, like five months later. And so it's like, I had no idea that it was going to take off the way that it did at all. 
And that was a big learning curve for me and just seeing what comes with all these eyes and ears. And then the membership of the group started to skyrocket. And we were really the first in this space of black travel. You know, now there's a ton of groups, but we were the first catalyst. Like none of these places were around. And the majority of the CEOs of the companies that have come from it, they all started as Nomadness members. And so it's just crazy to see the evolution, but it's beautiful, you know, because it shows the impact and that I was really answering a call, not just for myself, but for so many people around the world. And early blunders, I think the second, I started Nomadness in September, 2011. We did five trips in 2012. And then I must've went stupid for 2013 because we had eight trips slash events set up for the whole year including a month-long cross-country RV tour. And it was just way too much. I almost burnt myself completely out of nomadness going into year three. And it was terrifying and it was alarming. I'm glad I did that early because it, it showed me my boundaries. It showed me what I wanted to do, what I didn't. I, I think in 2013, I started to feel like I had to keep up with what was being requested of me instead instead of reminding myself that like I run this, you know what I'm saying? And like, this will go where I take it. You know, I will listen and adhere to the advice and interests of everybody in the group because it's about the community. But at the same point in time, like the community is no good if I'm not there to lead it, you know? And I was burning out. And there was a trip, the last trip of that year. So after going through 12 months of, I mean, I was on the road every like four to six weeks, nonstop that whole year. It was asinine. And um, we had our trip to Bali and it was a new year's trip to Bali. I had actually stayed at this venue eight months prior, which is what put it on my radar and everything was fine. Yet when we came with our group and we took the whole compound over, it was just a mess. I was dealing with, I didn't even tell the people that were on the trip in real time because I knew it would just make a bad situation worse. But like I was dealing with racial issues on one point in time. The woman who I had dealt with eight months earlier and was the booking agent got a surprise like anniversary trip and actually wasn't there for our trip for New Year's. And it was passed off to somebody else. But come to find out like the owners of the property were just like, we want them out anyway. So we're not going to change the towels. They didn't clean the pool. Like it was just like, are you kidding me? You know, and it was just, it really destroyed the experience for a number of people that were there, you know, and I had to step in and face the music, you know, it's like, look, I have no control over these major things, but I'm going to sit here at 11 o'clock at night with a pen and a pad, and I'm going to let you guys use me as a punching bag to tell me all of your ales on what's going on with this trip. And first thing in the morning, I'm taking this entire list with my own additions to the person that is the highest up on management. And all of us are coming to talk to you face to face. So one of the things is like, even when shit gets crazy, you have to be a leader and you have to rise to the occasion. And if whatever you're building involves community, if you're not ready to answer that call when things are pretty and shitty, it may not be for you. You know what I'm saying? It just may not. It's never fun. <laughs> you know, I've been through trips like that, but then I've also been in like tragedy and triumph with these people going from weddings and seeing, you know, tribe babies pop up all the way to I've attended funerals of my tribe members as well. So it really runs the gamut of how entrenched in the community you want to be as an, as a leader and a business owner and who you are as a person and as a leader and a business owner, you know, are you going to kind of stand behind the logo or are you going to get out in front and really show these people that this isn't just another thing that's creative. I'm not just trying to make money off of you anytime we have a trip, but like, I genuinely care about the people that you are. And, and that's always been important to me through the amazing accomplishments and through the blunders all the way to, you know, even dealing with life cycles and, and death. Do you think in the beginning that you felt, especially going into the third year when you felt so burnt out, that you felt pressure to make it, to keep it alive? And so just doing any and everything to keep, you know, income coming in, to make people happy. Do you think that was part of that? I mean... I think it was a bit of all of that. It was a bit of people pleasing. It was a bit of, you know, we made these promises and people have already put money into it. So obviously I'm not going to like cancel a trip, 
you know, and, and they were all worth it on the back end. And it, and obviously as an entrepreneur, like you've got to find ways to make money period. Like that's always an issue. So I think it was kind of, it wasn't one thing pinpointed. It wasn't even two things pinpointed. It's you're constantly juggling all of those at the same time. I think what happens is as you grow into yourself and into your company and you have confidence and you understand their patterns a little bit more over years of working with them, you relax a little bit. You really do. You relax a little bit. I say that, you know, on a spectrum of one to 10, my reaction at a level 10 is still the same. What's changed is that I don't get to a level 10 for the same things I would get to a level 10 at like three, four years ago. You know, three, four years ago, the level 10 stuff that I was flipping out about may get me to like a five right now, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I'm like, cause you just, it's just wisdom. It's experience. It's like life. You go through life when you're younger. Oh my gosh. Like this is the end of the world. And then your parents are looking at you like chick, if you don't get it together and relax and understand that it's not, but you have to go through that life experience a couple times over to understand that it's not the end of the world and everything will be okay. And it'll all get back to the way it's supposed to, you know? And so I just, I kind of, I have more confidence in the process, my abilities and my group than I did before. I think most of us listening to this are trying to figure out this business model and think, okay, when did you start to make money from this? Like, what are the revenue streams in your business? I think it's, I mean, it, there, first off, there's a number of them, but it started with like the trips. I mean, it started very organically, like the trips slash events that we do every year is part of it. Um, the merchandise site is part of it. Now, you know, we have everything from like our online travel class with Black Box to there's a lot of sponsorship and advertising that we bring in. And a lot of that is funneled to the events that we do and just kind of like social media and things like that partnerships that we have, like Airbnb has been on board with us for the last like three years, as well as now my personal brand is growing in tandem with Nomadness now. So I'm getting a lot of keynote speaking and presenting stuff. I have my own marketing course online, face your brand at faceyourbrand.com. That's part of it. So it's never like, I'm always juggling probably at least five multiple streams of income at the same time. And really that's what it's about. Like you've got to diversify your income. Don't put all your financial eggs in one basket. That's like the surefire way to like, you know, kill yourself. So you have to make sure that you're juggling all of these. But I decided early on in the beginning that I didn't want to charge for membership into my group. I wanted the community to be free, to be accessible. The only thing that you needed to do was like go through the newbie boot camp, and that's it, you know. And as we grow into things and stuff like our app comes out, there'll be paid elements to it. But for the last six years, the group itself has been something that was really accessible through the Facebook platform. And it's been more about, you know, a checks and balances system for entry to make sure that the integrity of the people in the group is intact. But yeah, money, you, money comes and it comes from a number of different ways. You've had awesome partnerships, like you've mentioned, Airbnb, Hyatt, even Issa Rae. Like, did you approach those sponsors or did they approach you? And then how long was No Madness around before that phase of the business took place? Um, Issa and I sat on a panel together at Temple University like three years ago. So the universe bought Issa and I together. And I didn't approach her about doing anything with her at first. It was a lot of like getting to know, I was still in those early years in nomadness, but about six months after we met, I hit her up randomly and was like, listen, you really don't have anything that's unscripted on your YouTube channel and you don't have anything travel oriented. Like, I think I want to get back into documenting our trips and experiences and talking to our members that are black that live abroad as well. Like, would you be interested in having something like that on the YouTube channel? And it was like one of the fastest and easiest yeses I've ever gotten in my life. And so we just like, cause we meshed and we already had that rapport. So it just worked. And at that point in time, no madness was what, like three years old. Airbnb came maybe a year after that. They had reached out and also we're in partnership with uh, Anovia who does sponsorship acquisition. So when we decided that we wanted to bring our conference into fruition for the first year, it was like, okay, we want to get some dollars behind this. And that's like Anovia Bedford's like specialty. So we brought Anovia on. She got us linked with the um, New York office. But what was ironic is at the same time that the New York office was linking with Anovia for the event, I got reached out to and got a blind email from the headquarters in Silicon Valley saying that they wanted to work with us. So there was this like tandem thing that was happening at the same time time that we weren't aware of at first. But in that regard, 
headquarters actually found me and they reached out to me to um, just have a conversation, kind of see what we were up to and how they could get involved. And then we told them about the New York office uh, partnership that Anovia was working with. Hyatt came through Skift, which also they were people that approached me. That was like this advertising, not advertising, but it was a press a package that they put together called the Unbound Collection and people that were living outside of like normal boundaries. And a lot of it at this point are people coming to us, you know, but that's from years, literally years of me cold calling, cold emailing, popping up, creating my own press list from people that I knew, forging relationships that take nothing but time. You can't rush that process, especially if you don't have the money to pay for like a PR agent. You have to go through it every step of the way. It's a lot of researching and figuring it the hell out of our own accord. So tell us a little bit about, you mentioned some of the different arms of nomadness from conferences to courses. How do you decide what to launch next and what makes sense? Mm, Intuition actually is a big part of it because I am my demographic, right? Like when you look at the demographic for nomadness, it's like, Usually it's like a millennial female, black, you know, lives in like an urban area, travels around the world, college educated, usually between the ages of like 25 and 40, like that's our sweet spot. And so knowing that I am a part of the demographic that I serve, I can trust myself and my team's decisions a little bit more and faster. And so I look at it from a space of like, what do we need? What could we offer? What would be a value added to the actual group? And from there, different decisions are made with what to roll out. And then what does your team look like these days? You, you keep mentioning this team and I'm like, well, how big is it? And how do you keep the business running? It's small. There's only five of us and they're location independent. And so, you know, I have my assistant lives in New Jersey as well. So she's close to me, but it's like everybody started in New York six years ago, but now it's like, it's different people. It's also, you know, everybody lives all around the country. So that's something that we juggle as well too, is being location independent because everything kind of lives online with us. When did you start building it? Like how long were you in business before you were able to hire a team? I wasn't in business. Nomadness was about three months old. We were a month away from having that first trip to Panama. And I was observing people in the group that one, I felt like they could plug the holes of weaknesses that I had, but things that I needed with their strengths or interest and people that I had knew that would have my back, you know, just kind of figuring this out because I was like, I don't know what the hell this is. I don't know (laughs) if it's ever going to make money. So I kind of pinpointed these people And I sent them a chain letter type of text message. Like, if you want to be a part of the next biggest thing in travel, meet at this place at this time. And I didn't tell them who was going to be there. And essentially the address, it was my address and they were all meeting at my living room. And I was just going to kind of pitch them on this idea with no madness and be like, yo, like, these are the parameters. I don't know when and if this is going to make any money. Like, you would really be doing this out of your own interest and help, but let me know. And it was so funny because the people I picked, like two people went to college together and I didn't know that. So they like walked in and they were like, yo, if you picked her, like I'm definitely in because she doesn't play. And I know this because like I went to school with her. So it was very interesting to see this like element of surprise, but also how the personalities and the talent meshed. And really that's how I started it. How are you navigating being the founder of this movement while also building your own brand, as you said, and doing so much? Just day by day. I mean, it's like it's you have a to-do list every day. I try to give time allocations to different things on my to-do list so that I have an idea of what my workload looks like on a daily basis. And, you know, I'm getting better at delegating and letting people in, which was like a big problem that I had in the beginning because I'm a control freak. But all of those things together are really helping. You know, I wouldn't be able to do this alone by any means. And I think just evolution and growth as Avita has also helped the evolution and the growth of no madness, you know, and, and understanding that, reminding myself the lessons that I learned from 2013, like you still control this, <laughs> you know, like the, the boat will still steer wherever you focus. And so make sure that it's on a path, not just the fulfillment for the, the community and the team, but also for myself, you know, making sure that I'm happy. I just had this conversation with Issa a couple of weeks ago. I was like, you know, I'm just, I'm in this space where I'm constantly taking inventory 
of my happiness along the way. I don't want to be one of these people that's on the road thinking that happiness is this destination that they're going to get to. And then I get there and it's like miserable and it's not what I thought. I want to make sure that I'm honoring myself in the path to, you know, the growth of and honoring no madness at the same time. And that's something that I used to ask myself that every six months, then it was like every four months. And ever since I did the Ted residency this year, it's like, now I ask myself every month, you know, are you happy? What do you love about no madness? What do you hate? And like, whatever you hate, what do you have to do to get rid of it as soon as possible so that we can get on this path to smiling as much as possible and being present as much as possible with the day to day as well as the big goals. And so I think that that's really, it's really important. And I had to give myself permission to keep fine tuning it and sifting it out to, you know, find that gem and where I'm really, really headed with this. So right now we're going to transition to a really quick lightning round where you answer the first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? Yeah. All righty. Number one, what's a resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? Um, Slack. Number two, what's been the best business book or podcast episode that you've consumed this year? Oh, shit. Becoming Oprah. Number three, who inspires you and why? Gosh, there's so many levels to that. Um, I'm going to go with the tattoo that I'm looking at, um, on my arm, uh, Steve jobs. And I, a couple of years ago, I tattooed, it was the day after our anniversary party. Actually, I tattooed the quote from him, stay hungry, stay foolish. And it's on my left forearm. And it's just always a reminder to go for it. Unfortunately, I've had to deal with other people's deaths at a young age, starting from a young age but it's always given me the permission and reminder that life is a one-way ticket. And so I move with a sense of urgency and and divine kind of conviction and alchemy with the things that I want to bring into fruition. That's why I don't believe in those five and 10 year plans. (laughs) So (laughs) it's just like, you don't even know if you're going to be here in five or 10 years, like get it together. So, (laughs) So for me, Steve just... We're aggressive. I am not as much of an asshole as he was known to be by any means whatsoever, but I am very aggressive and forceful and unapologetic when I get into the zone of needing things done the way that I see them. I've also learned from him that A plus team members want to work and collaborate with other A plus team members. And that's hard because it means that teams change over time. You know, and what we needed in No Madness six years ago, five years ago, two years ago is different from what we need today. And so that part of the business is um, it's hard. It's very hard for any CEO, but it's also necessary for growth, you know, and just the whole theology of making not just your team that works with you, but your people around you, you know, garnering a mentor like Issa, you know, doing something like the TED residency where I was around some of the most brilliant minds in the world every day for three and a half months, you know, culminating with all of us giving a TED talk. Like it's just, it's putting yourself in these positions where you're not the smartest person in the room and it's forcing you to rise to the next level of yourself. That's very important. And a lot of those lessons I learned through reading, watching videos and interviews, but also reading Walter Isaacson's um, bio that he did on Steve Jobs. And yeah, Steve, for better or worse, he did it. Like he, he made that dent that he said, that proverbial dent in the universe. And I think No Madness has made that proverbial dent in the travel industry. What's your parting advice for women who want to be their own boss, but are worried about losing that steady paycheck? Uh, Sell something and then sell it again and keep selling it until you don't recognize the names of the people who are buying it, because then, you know, you have something that people want. Ooh, I like that. All righty, Evita, thank you so much for being in the guest chair. Now, what's the best way that we can connect with you after this episode? Um, my personal social media across the board is at EV Robbie, E V I E R O B B I E. Um, and you can follow No Madness across the board social media at No Madness Tribe. And our website is nomadnesstv.com. All righty, guys. So there you have it.
Hey guys, thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you want to hear more from me, head on over to sidehustlepro.co forward slash side hustle corner to get my weekly side hustle diaries chronicles about my own journey from passion project to profitable business. And if you want to find me online, I'm at Side Hustle Pro on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't forget to join the Side Hustle Pro Facebook community. Go to sidehustlepro.co forward slash master. Mind. And as always, if you love the show, do me a favor and subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks, guys. Talk to you next week.